it's critical that um, business is taught to the same level as architecture and design is. Business of Architecture UK, episode 52. Ryan Willard here, Business of Architecture UK, with a very special announcement. This Wednesday, I will be leading a webinar which will be looking at how three leaders of top UK architecture practices have broke the mold and grown their businesses from being bedroom practices or working in the spare room to international offices with landmark projects. Um, in this training, you will discover how these architects have gone from very humble beginnings, not knowing where work was going to come from, to building these internationally respected offices with these multi-million pound projects that in some cases define city skylines. Um, we're going to look at a number of different things. You're going to learn the three breakthrough secrets for building a dream practice how you can master your messaging to attract your ideal clients, and also how to define your niche to be able to win work. So make sure that you register to the webinar. I will provide the details in the information below. So go along, register that, and I'll look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week we've got the second part of our BOA UK live event that happened a couple of months ago where we were discussing the seven threats to an architecture business or the seven most common obstacles that many architecture businesses and practices experience. And I think we were halfway through our panel discussion with David West, with Tara Boladay, Johan Taft, Tim Burgess and Hazel Rounding were discussing how they have navigated around these obstacles and threats and how these threats actually have evolved over the course of them running a practice and how they change as their practices grow. So without any more hesitation, sit back and relax and enjoy part two of Seven Threats to an Architecture Practice. I think it's quite interesting to hear how these threats or how these how these obstacles how they change over time and obviously, and obviously it's it's quite interesting to maybe Hazel you could say a bit more about how these have started how as a more mature practice more a mature business these are very different animals yeah I mean I I think we because we had the benefit of surviving the 2008 and it was that it was a 10 year old practice but it was it was a new business and it was about survival. Mm. Um, I think, you know, uh, without um, underselling those first two years, what we had created was a brand and an identity. And we were very much about a design practice and we were very much about taking that forward. Um, so we had values related to that as much as anything. Um, 2008 was really difficult. I think a lot of people had to rebuild businesses after it. Um, what we set out to do more than anything was to um, make sure that we were diversified, retaining the brand standards, retaining our approach. We diversified in terms of geography. We were Liverpool-based. We opened a London office. We diversified in terms of clients. Uh, we used uh, the work that we already had from those 10 years to really sell ourselves. You know, a lot of people were left with concrete frames on site. We were lucky enough to have finished a really big residential project and a really big commercial project, and we just took those out. And, you know, took the, when we talk about fear of selling, for me, that was a bit of a case of, well, nobody really knows me. I've got nothing to lose, but I've got two really good projects and a whole portfolio behind those to sell. So. You know, let's just do it. <laughs> let's let's give it a go. Um, sorry, I can't remember your original question. Um, just how it's changed. Yeah. Um, the market's changed, obviously. Um, I think that I think that architects are maybe a bit better at not just being architects. You know, I think mm. that we used to sell buildings and only buildings and I think there's a bigger awareness of place and there's a bigger awareness of product and and everything that goes into architecture and you know it's at architecture schools we're all taught it's a very wide subject but it's very easy to fall into this trap of just delivering a plot and a building mm. and um, and so I think that 
the market has changed in that respect and the successful practices have reacted to that market. Um, I think that you know people are more design aware generally, which helps. Um, but then we have our struggles as well. I think staff expectations are different to what they were 10 years ago. I think this generation has different expectations of reward. Um, so it, it's constantly changing. And all you can do is try to stay ahead of the game and try to keep the balance always in everything that you do. Great. Yeah. Yes, working with uh, firms with dozens of staff, some of these problems are quite evident. For instance, losing talent. One of the reasons why one the companies I'm working with right now are losing talent is because the company, the, the, the architect, the chief architect, is not selling to the right target audience. So he's attracted staff who, he's attracted staff into a brand promise, if you like. Mm. Does that make sense? And because of his poor selling, and I'll call it that, and discounting, he's attracting a, a client a client profile different to that, inferior, if you like. And so the staff are no longer doing the great, beautiful projects they were promised they would do. And now there's a seepage leaking of staff. And then, then what tends to happen, the opposite happens, that then the desperation settles in, and then we keep staff that we shouldn't really be keeping. And then you're in big trouble. You've lost your talent, and you're now pinning your hopes on people who don't have the capability or the desire, or both. Um, Henry Ford once said, it's better to train people and lose them rather than not train them and keep them. And, and so because of the, the desperation, the training isn't being provided, or the retraining. Um, the good thing about architecture is that most architects come out of school well-trained in architecture. Got to hand that to the industry. And I, I think that's, mm -hmm. you could say, architect, you can't say that for every profession. Some professions aren't regulated. But architecture, it is. And that's a strength and a weakness at the same time. But obviously, mm -hmm. every single architecture practice has its own flavor, its own feel, its own um, mission, its own passion. And so uh, staff need to be molded is probably the wrong word, but um, formed into that picture of what that is. So they need to start owning that. Otherwise, they're just a standard architecture out of architecture school. And if they remain a standard architect out of architecture school and don't receive the training because the budgets aren't there, the time isn't there, or the organization's on its back foot all the time, they will eventually leave. They're not getting that extra passion in their lives. And, um, mm. and that's sad to see. Tara. Yeah. Um, I also think it's important to recognize that practices need to uh, see the market and adapt to it because in, in terms of the staff that we're taking on in the first place because society is changing and we millennials whatever don't do or want to do nine to five Monday to Friday and I think when we're stuffed into practice that we have to work these hours and are not allowed to I think live our full lives it's far less entertaining we live in social media society and all our peers are doing far more interesting things than working on one to five details months on end. Um, which joyous as it can be, um, that we are so multifaceted and that's the great advantage of being an architect but also the great uh, challenge of being an architect because we're so diverse in how we think. And I don't know very many architects that are only interested in architecture. I was speaking earlier to someone and there are many architects who are interested in pottery and sketching and whatever else. And I think when there's that lack of appreciation for what our, um, our talent, our staff want, and encouraging them to do that, I think it's easier to lose talent. I think actually when you fan those flames of, actually if you've got another talent, make a business out of it, we'll support you however we can. It's just inevitable. You'll have someone um, who stays with you longer because they're like, actually this person believes in what I'm trying to achieve here. Mm. And I think once, once you're able to adapt, as a practice, once you're able to adapt to the type of staff that are coming in, then they're just more likely to work harder for you. They're just more likely to dedicate far more to you. Mm. So yeah, I think practices also need to change the way we think about. I would, I would, I would completely uh, support that. Uh, our practice is at its most powerful to date, absolutely categorically at its most powerful to date not just because of the 
size of our practice, but because of the spirit and energy mm -hmm. in our studio at the moment. And I underline studio rather than office. And I think one of the reasons for that, um, apart from a, 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 a very reasonable, lucky, touch wood level of success, particularly over the last couple of years, to win uh, the commissions that some, uh, if not all of us, have been dreaming about, and we've lost a, a fair amount of amazing commissions that we were dreaming about too. But I, I think the reason for that amazing level of energy and therefore power and optimism um, is uh, because we have a, a showroom uh, that is um, a, a, a massive outlet for our studio. Mm. And the showroom uh, it can, can showcase uh, an absolute extraordinary plethora of, of interests. You know, one of the opening uh, shows in our showroom was actually simply called Spare Time. And it was, it was simply us recognising the sheer level of talent within the four window walls of our, of our studio. And all currently 65 people at that point showcased something that they did in their spare time. And we made the equivalent of a Royal Academy Summer Show Mini uh, in September. And, and it was great, it was beautiful, and, and, and you could feel the passion and the, 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 the level of, of com, uh, complex um, uh, qualities that were in, were in the studio. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, I can, I can have a voice, 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 mm -hmm. and now we're driving all sorts of amazing initiatives, whether it's about industry and stacked living or car parking or colleges and high streets, etc., etc. This amazing energy is emanate, literally emanating uh, for, for, from our showroom. And if I was working within our studio, which I do, um, I would feel that energy. And it, it's, it's beyond the day-to-day -day project. And, and so I think that diversification of our profession and that um, uh, reaching out and exploring uh, uh, um, uh, in a different way is, um, is, is, is obviously... Uh, part of the future of the profession in terms of its resilience, yeah. obviously. Sure. Brilliant. Tim, do you want to add something? So, remind me of your original question. <laughs> My original question was asking how these have, how these kind of evolve over time as practices mature. Ah. Well, I think the simple answer to that is you start with a cash problem, you move on to a time problem, and you end at a people problem. That's broadly how it goes. And that is because at the beginning, you have to go and get the work. You haven't got any work, so you've got a cash problem. Therefore, you've got a marketing problem, essentially. Then you get some work in, and then you've got to figure out how to do the work. And then you've got a time problem, because there's not enough time or people to do all the work. So then you get loads of people in. And then what you're left with is you've got enough work, time to do the work, and you're just dealing with the people part. And that's where I think you, know, you have to have the sense of purpose, mission, whatever it is, that attracts in the mm. right people who want to be on your ship going in the direction it's broadly going in, mm. and also being part of that ship and deciding collectively, you know, mm. where you're going. Mm. Because that's what, you know, ultimately then gives it its um, liftoff. Mm. But yeah, I suspect that's the general trajectory. Brilliant. Anyone else like to add anything to that? Um, I would just like to add to that little story that then I think that that ship is is about a bit of natural evolution with the people that you've brought on board. Um, I think our practice has only evolved because of the people that have bought into it. They're the right kind of people, and then mm -hmm. everybody needs to to have something else to move on to and some kind of career growth because that is when you start phasing losing talent. So you've got to evolve opportunities for those people. We would never have opened a London studio if someone hadn't said, I'll give it a go. We would never really start talking about place if somebody hadn't said, I care about more than the buildings. So, you know, it's kind of how a practice never gets stale as well. And that, that will only happen with the people around you. You know, we're only as good as the people we employ. Mm. So great. I, was I think it's, was it's crucial to recognise the drives <laughs> and the differentiation between the people that um, uh, are within a creative environment. I think it's so, so crucial. Not everybody wants to set up their own practice. Mm. Read all about it. Not everybody wants to do it. It's not an absolute, you must do this. 
Um, I think I must have interviewed and employed hundreds of people <laughs> over the last 15, 20 years. I was a director at Will Allsop's practice for three years before setting up uh, my own, you know, um, our practice. And um, I think uh, it, with my business partner, Christophe Egre, and I didn't think I wanted to set up my own practice. It wasn't something that absolutely kept me up at night saying, I've got to do this, I've got to do this. It was just a, and it's a long story, which wouldn't be in a three minutes, so I'm not going to tell it, but it was just a, a moment in time. Oh, actually, fuck it, I'll do it. You know, I'll have a go at that and, and do that. Um, it wasn't something that was driving me and eating me up and saying, I must do this. But boy, there's been at least five people that I've interviewed and within seconds known that person will be setting up their own practice within the next five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. And that's great. And I'm enjoying them in our studio while they want to be within our studio. Um, and good luck when they're ready to, to fly and hopefully we can help um, that you know we'll be in a position to help that but it's not that that's then the be all and end all there are lots of people who don't want to do that and actually work um, and continue to work and grow and nurture the team that they're within mm -hmm. and as long as that constant sort of um, either a, a, a career growth financial growth or, or straightforward um, <laughs> uh, happiness <laughs> is continuing to grow in terms of support in terms of their, their lives their choices their locational choices their family choices their schooling choices as their uh, continued uh, uh, life uh, uh, continues in front of them is respected and, and nurtured, um, I think you can uh, in enjoy retention uh, for the right reasons rather than keep in here. You know. And I think that while not everybody might want to start their practice, I think it is important that everyone within an architectural practice learns about the business of architecture. Absolutely. Because while they may not want to start their own practice, once they understand what the purpose of a timesheet is, um, once they understand what the purpose of fee what the fees you're charging are, what the profit you're making is, they're far more vested in the practice. They're far uh, more likely to call up a different type of client to help you diversify as a practice. Um, they're far more likely to make sure that your practice grows and thrives because they're invested in the whole business. Absolutely. When architects are stuck to just architecture, you you lose talent. You know your your practice doesn't grow because you don't have people who are vested in it. Um, I think once you really start to understand the purpose of practice of marketing, you enjoy it far better. I've come across far too many architects, including me in my previous years, who are just not confident to speak to a client, not confident to speak to other architects, which is shocking because we're, we're used to speaking in crits, we're used to defending our own um, ideas in university, mm. and then we come out and we're so focused on this detailing or <laughs> design, which I enjoyed, I don't want to make it like I didn't, but, um, but then I, I think we, we, we lose our value, we lose actually, the, again, the, the range of talents that we have, we're unable to express that. And yeah, when we're not able to learn about the whole business, we don't need to know every single detail, but I think once everybody's invested in how practice runs and why, why we do things the way we do, starting with why, it's just a far easier and far more enjoyable ride. Mm. You, you've got a problem when the only person thinking about sales, you were talking about sales and marketing, I do sales and marketing, when the only person thinking about sales is the boss, you've got a problem. Yeah. You've got a very big problem. And when employees do not, are not part of that culture of expansion and growth and finding the next client, all they want to do is fulfill the work, you're stuck. You can't do it on your own. And, and that's your fault. You know, if you've got a whole bunch of employees, all they want to do is just draw or design and they just see themselves as design architects and they're not part of the business, it's your fault. Mm. And it's your opportunity at the same time. So um, the more, you know, I, I really like what you, you, you shared there, how you've, you know, people talk, they call it now. They now call it um, employee engagement. We used to call it a sense of ownership. Employees have a sense of ownership in the business when they see the big picture of the business. Mm -hmm. When they see the passion and they share the passion, they start owning chunks of that business. And you expand on that. You know, you can only eat the pizza a slice at a time, so don't give them too much. You know, but they've got their expertise, and you start expanding that, and you find things that they might be interested in. Give them a little bit. Give them a bit of responsibility. Let them run. Make a few mistakes. Pick themselves up. And, and now you've got, you know, like, again, Henry Ford, he said some great things. He, he said that uh, for every, I have all these employees, basically I pay for all these uh, uh, arms and legs in my factories, and the great thing is I get all these brains thrown in for free. 
<laughs> yeah. And you have, you've got these people doing all this creative work for you, but you've got brains, you've got these people, know people, they know networks, they speak to your target audience probably more frequently than you do because they're out there in the field. Mm -hmm. I, do, I do think the more you can share with your team, I hope, because I'm sort of in the founding director position, so I can only slightly assume to know what people think of me, is um, the more you can share, the more uh, you can be respected and the more uh, people can feel empowered. Mm. Uh, and I personally make a huge effort to share as many highs and as many lows, as raw, <laughs> with as much raw emotion as I can, as it happens, rather than concealing things. So when we win, we win big, and when we lose, we lose big together. And uh, we had one two weeks ago, it was extraordinary, it was the day after Valentine's Day, and we lost so hard, it was such a horrible thing. I was actually in a state of shock about the loss, but we gathered, all 65 plus of us, together, and we had a moment of mourning, and, uh, and, uh, and it was good, and I felt better for sharing, and everybody knew, and I didn't hold anything back from what I had just learned from the client who let us down, um, and the uh, wicked architect that had four discounted to win work uh, <laughs> half the price of the market, I'm afraid. I won't name and shame, I'd love to. A um, couple more drinks I would, but I know. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and we shared that, and it was good, you know, and, 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 and I think too many practices, and I'm, I'm sharing that because I don't know any of you, I, can't, I know one of you, definitely. Uh, Sophie, because you were, used to work in the studio and, and, and um, a great future. And... Uh, it's just if you're in small practice, I think there are quite a lot of people, and I've learned this because people have told me when I've interviewed them for jobs, I'm leaving that practice because I don't know what's going on. Mm. I'm leaving mm. that practice because I don't feel any affinity to the leadership. I'm leaving that practice because it's all kind of held inside and mm. secretive, and, and I don't want that. <laughs> and uh, I'm a, I'm, uh, I want uh, to see where my career is progressing. I'm not just a designer. I, I, I do acknowledge the other things that are going on in, in, in the world, and I want to be part of that and uh, uh, if you're in a five person practice, 10 person practice, 15 person practice, 20, 30, whatever it is, I think it's incredibly important to, 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 to share you know? and, yeah. uh, and, and you're not taught to do that <laughs> at architecture school because it's mostly, mostly taught to be about you yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. pitching your pitch. Yeah. Yeah. I completely yeah. agree and in a way that was the thing that launched me into setting up a practice. I worked in a practice where I felt disempowered, I felt uh, you know, lost and alone, and I didn't really understand what was going on. I didn't feel valued, I didn't feel respected, I didn't feel looked after. And I just thought, you know what, I'd be no worse out in the world by myself, just paddling my own little canoe right mm. now, than I am here. And in doing that, it, it gave me this perfect model of like, that is, that is the opposite of where I want to be. Mm. And I'm going to create something in a completely different model which is the type of place where I would love to go and work. Mm. Great. So, you know, we can, we, you can work flexibly in my practice. Uh, if you want to bring your dog to work, that's fine. If you turn up with your kids, that's also fine. Mm. You know, it's like, it properly is, it's whatever. It, it's, what, it's your full life, right? That yeah. whole thing of you just turn up. Yeah work the hours you want to work, I mean, within some kind of, you know, <laughs> once we've established what needs to get done on any given week and what your responsibilities are, there's, there's freedom and there's flexibility because that's the type of place where, you know, because at the time I was working in practice, I had a kid, I wanted to work flexibly. And although I could, I could do it, I felt like I wasn't really one of the crew. I wasn't really pulling my way and it was a difficult place to be. Mm. And I just thought, I never, ever want to make anyone feel that way. And so it became a completely different sort of model. Every, I think every organization will have its culture. Mm. But the bottom line is this, you can distill it right down. If you're running a business, an architecture business, or any other business for that matter, but from an architecture point of view, if you're running an architecture business, you need to understand this. Architecture is about drawings, bricks, and mortar. Correct? Space. Distill it down? Space. <laughs> yeah? Making life better. Making life better. <laughs> That's it. Architecture business is about people, first and foremost. People make money for you. It's about people. You're right. It's people and money. And if you're running an architecture business, I would suggest that you make it your business to put the horse before the cart and get absolutely brilliant at understanding people and money. The rest, you've got all these people you pay good money. They'll figure it out on the architecture side. And, of course, bring them into the wider conversation as well. 
that too many people are running businesses because they were good technicians. You know, plumber, electrician, restaurateur, loves food, starts a chain of restaurants, starts one, then two, then three, doesn't understand people. Massive turnover. That industry I worked in, it could be up to two or 300% per year turnover. You're turning your whole staff twice or three times a year. That's painful. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, KFC, interesting. I'm working with KFC right now with their MD. They have employees. Interesting company. I didn't know too much about them before. They have employees there who work, work for them for 37 years. I met a restaurant manager. She was 72 years old. That's an extraordinary corporate culture. And what they're doing now, they're franchising it all. So you have this massive giant of a big, big organization, American company that has this very, very strong people culture, and they're they're now breaking it up and selling it to franchisees. And the franchisees, they're tigers. All they want to do is make money. And now people who have been in the company 20, 30, 40 years are leaving because the culture is different. So culture mm -hmm. is so important. And you decide mm -hmm. what your culture will be. And it will, I'm sure it will reflect your personality to a large degree. So you have a preference for the right type of freedom around hours and okay bring that if that's your personality you're comfortable with that bring that into your organization if you're not comfortable don't do it it'll, it'll drive you crazy set up a culture which is the right culture for you and the right culture for your business and you'll attract people who are consistent with that culture I'm guessing if you yeah. come from a navy background that's probably not going to rock your world well the interesting <laughs> thing is you, you, on one, one ship had a very collaborative culture and the other ship was a dictatorship guess where I wanted to work <laughs> on the first one of course yeah. so you see you, yeah. you see uh, different cultures and, and, and in large, large organizations, you can go from one branch to the other. And I know as consumers, you walk into one prêt à manger and there's a kind of a nice vibe and they're playing jazz music and it's, it's a nice place to be. And the other one feels very sterile, cold, and people feel miserable. Now that will be the same with architecture practices. You walk into one and the, the client walks in and feels this is a wonderful, warm, creative, collaborative space, but it's all business as well, and the other one is disorganized, and, 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 and if, they, if they're just about money, guess which one they choose? If it's just about the money, they just want the project, where will the, the client go? To the fancy one with the nice jazz music and all the creativity, but it's all business, or to the one which is a bit disorganized, a little bit wobbly? Which one will they, they target for cheap? Yeah. Yeah, so if you're attracting people who are targeting you and, and, and hitting you hard for discounts, guess which camp you're in? Your culture has a lot to do with that. Well, um, a kind of question that's on my mind yeah. from this discussion is, our profession has a wonderful way of being always in conversation, like events like this and, you know, you look, just look on Twitter, for example, our... our industry talks a lot to itself. What do you think are the roles of larger practice in developing the culture of architects in general? That's an open, open question. Can you repeat the question? What is the role of larger practices in, in their cultivation of smaller practices, basically, in, in developing culture in the industry? Or is it something that we only, we only look at within our own organizations? My answer to that and why the business is they're two very different beasts. Large organizations are large for a very good reason. And they have an appetite for growth. They usually take no prisoners. You know, there's a particular feel about an organization, whereas a small little boutique will be fun, run very, very differently. And often there's a culture clash when you bring successful people from the large one into the smaller one. You upset a lot of people in the small one. You move someone from the smaller one to the big one. They don't really like it. It's a cold environment. I'm not saying everyone, but large organizations get large for, for a particular reason. And a lot of business, small business people aspire to become large companies. And that can be very that can be very um, debilitating for them. You know, a large organization is large for, for a very good reason. It has, a, it has a way of seeing the world and a way of operating, and um, that won't be to everybody's liking. And so sometimes small is beautiful. And, uh, you know, way back there was a book that came out called The E-Myth. Did anyone ever read that? 
which was, mm. yeah, you read that. It was, it was an entrepreneur, book about entrepreneurism and was basically um, teaching people that you shouldn't, well, people misinterpreted it, but how it came across to people, the feedback is that uh, if you're a plumber, forget about being a plumber, you'll never make money. You should, you should set, up, set up a plumbing business. Right? If you're an architect, you'll never make a lot of money. You need to become an, architect, an architecture firm to make money. Now, the guy who's, or the girl who's really good at architecture might love to be an architect, and this is why we were talking about earlier on, some people won't want to go and set up their own businesses. And if they do, it could be the most miserable thing they've ever done. Their life is turned to misery, because they're not wired that way. And, um, and the learning curves are too steep, and the mistakes are too shocking to them, and now they've got to deal with all these other factors which they have no idea about or don't particularly they care to be, they want to be working in their little sector. So it's very important not to push people. So sometimes we promote people into management because they're very good at what they do. Suddenly their life is turned to hell. They might not tell you because they don't want to upset you, but if you read between the lines, you'll see their life, is, it, was, it was too much for them. Tim. I thought I might answer a different question, um, which was... Go for it. <laughs> well, in a sense, I was thinking, what, you know, what do big practices do to shape the way I work? And actually, I look more outside the industry to, than in it to shape the practice. And I had the, the really um, wonderful experience recently of I went to Cranfield University and did a business growth um, course there where I met owner managers or owner... Uh, yeah, owner managers of businesses all around the country doing different things. And that was fascinating because you then saw um, what a professional consultancy working in London is like compared to bigger businesses doing all sorts of different things from a haulage business to a you know, guy with a sock factory to you know, a farmer. And then how your business model actually worked in relation to all the others. And I mean, going back to the cash flow thing for a moment, I had this kind of light bulb moment when someone was telling me about you know, how Tesco's deal with um, their uh, payment terms. And you know, as, a, as a professional consultant, one says, can you, do, you know, can you maybe do this project? And you know, we'd like to get some ideas and do some ideas. And it's like, well, we think about it. You know, let's, let's maybe we can get you started on this small thing and you do some work. And then at some point, you invoice, and your invoice are on 30-day payment terms. And you know, three months has gone by before you see any cash. And then you compare that to how Tesco's work. And Tesco's open a store. They uh, have some stuff in their store which they sell. And what are their payment terms? You buy something in Tesco's, how long does it take them to get the money? Instant, right? So they sell out the whole store in a, in a week, and they take in their first <coughs> million quid. And then the next week, again, and they f the truck turns up, fills it back up, and they do that. Now, what are, their, uh, what are their payment terms to their suppliers? That cauliflower that you've got, how long does it take the guy who grew the cauliflower to get his money off 90 Tesco's? 90 days. 90 days, right. So you realize that those guys are on a bow wave of cash because they've basically sold it you know, 12 times over before they've paid the guy for the cauliflower. They've you know, got 12 million pounds in the bank, and they're just breaking even. They don't, they just have to, they don't have to even make a profit on what they're selling because they've just got positive cash flow all the time. And then you think about how, how our business is working, that comparison to that, and you start thinking, holy mackerel, we've got a really crazy sort of scenario. And actually, it's really made me think hard about payment terms, about you know, all our suppliers and how long we can actually push out payment terms and how we can shorten you know, our, the money that's coming in. How can we shorten the terms? And things like that, I think, have been far more um, enlightening than thinking, what are the big architecture practices doing? Not that I would know what they're doing, but I think that's, you know, that's where I've sort of been looking to learn, I suppose. The, the interesting thing about that Tesco story is they took it so far that they had a rebellion from their suppliers and they struggled to find good suppliers at one point because they screwed them down so, so hard with so no support, like no help. <laughs> so, yeah. so it can go the other way. So you want to find, you want to find the, the, the right balance between keeping your clients, uh, well, attracting good clients and being well paid and paid on time. And it's not that hard. Small little adjustments that you can make in your practice in your way of behaving, in your behavior, it's all behavior, all the, your, the mini behaviors you do with, with your prospects and your clients. If, if you think them out or you learn properly thought out behaviors, 
because basically we do what we do by default. Now, who in this room, if you're willing to share, went to selling school or went to negotiation school or went to school to learn how to collect invoices or negotiate invoices? <laughs> Nobody. So it's no surprise that some of you might, from time to time, possibly have a cash flow situation or a client who didn't pay on time. Anyone, anyone in the room never had a client that didn't pay on time? <laughs> no, because you haven't been learned. But if you do go to school and learn that, you'll be surprised that it's not that hard and that you can start reclaiming some of that power and control over one of your most important resources, which is cash. Mm -hmm. You've got cash, you've got intellectual property, and you've got people. Right? In architecture? Yeah. Those three things. And the cash one, because it's uncomfortable asking people, could you please pay me on time? I also think this is where it's important to recognize our value as architects. And uh, far too many architects don't recognize their value. I mean, for example, within our practice, we have a commencement fee. So if we're going to put pen to paper, you have to pay us. Um, and so clients tend to say, we have paid, please start work. Um, and then our payment terms, for example, are seven days. And if you can't buy into that, that's fine. We're, we're not compatible, and that's OK. And I think this is why it's important to diversify. Because when you're heavily reliant on your client who pays when they're ready, 30, 60, 90 days, then you're in trouble. And you, you know, you're grateful for whatever you get. So it's important, I think, to um, mm. recognize your value as an architect. And recognize, mm. I think we're, unfortunately for architects, as great as we are, I think, unfortunately for us, we're, we're, we're blinkered by just architecture and by this by this section. We don't recognize the project in context. We don't recognize that the client has to get funding, um, that, that they've got to go, go through their appraisals, um, that there's marketing at the end of it or at the beginning of it. I think once we start to understand the entire process and recognize our value within that and recognize that actually a client has brought us a site, um, but we know that we can get 10 units up on that site. It's going to cost 100,000 for each flat to be built, they're going to sell us at 300,000, there's a healthy profit after construction costs and all, all the legal fees have gone. We start to recognize, actually, we, we give the client that power. And if we're going to give that client that power, where's our cuts? And it, it just, again, it, it really, I think this is why it's important for architects to understand business. I, it's critical that um, business is taught to the same level as architecture and design is. We spend five years in university, learning designs, and we come out, and then there's building regs, and we're like, what's that? Um, and then it stops all your design. And so, and so I think um, business needs to be taught right, right from the beginning. You know, It's important that we recognize our value within the context. We recognize the whole context. And then we can start to have sensible conversations with clients. And suddenly, it's not, oh, we'll talk about costs later. You can't talk about costs later. You don't go into Tesco and take what you want and walk out and decide what you're going to pay for later. It doesn't make sense. So I, I think it's, it's an upfront conversation. And you, you need to like the people you work with. And I bang on about this diversity thing. And I think this is where diversity So you're not, you're not begging for work. You are confident about the quality of work you're producing because you've trained for it. And you know the value that you're adding to a project. So you need to be able to, we need to be able to, as a profession, speak very clearly from the beginning what it's going to cost. And if you can't afford it, or if you don't see the value in it, then that's fine. I'll go on to someone else who does. And we should learn to become the client, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else want to add to that? Well, how, how we buy, how we sell is how we buy, and how we buy is how we sell. So look at how you buy and how you treat your suppliers. And if you're unhappy with how your clients are treating you, think of how you're treating your suppliers. And there might be some parallels there. And so it's important, this upfront um, agreement, I have that with suppliers as well, so that there's parity between both parties, and those suppliers stick with me. And they'll supply me, if they, they, they're, there's a shortage of supply, they'll come to me with their supply first, so I don't run out. So it, go, it works both ways. And again, it's not that hard to learn. But if you don't learn it, you'll do what naturally comes to your mind, which is actually fear-based. Because of this whole, Ryan put it very well earlier on when he spoke about we're conditioned in our society to dislike sales and salespeople and selling. We, we, we distrust it. Would I be right in saying that? Yeah. Mm. We're taught from a kid, don't trust the salesperson. Mm. And, um, and selling is a, is, is a dirty profession. And if you can't do anything else, then you go into sales. But again, professional salesmen, very well-trained sales salesmen, 
and saleswomen are master communicators. They understand the human psyche very, very well. And 80% of selling is about psychology. 20 is process. But if you haven't learned that, you will be on the receiving end of your prospects or your clients buying mode, which is not pretty because they won't treat you as, as equals. They'll look to knock you down on price. Um, not only that, they will then demand more things. Does that ever happen? So you've, you've given them a discount, and now they want more, but you don't want to lose them, so you give them a little bit more, more time, more people, more resource, more whatever, and it goes on and on and on, and then they don't pay on time. And you said, well, I don't want to chase him too hard because I don't want to upset him because he might pull out. <laughs> ever happened to anyone in this room? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and, and it goes on and on. And so, so it, if you want to disrupt that cycle, then you can. And you can, you can start doing things differently like you have, admirable. Uh, I never do any work before I've been paid. I get paid first and then I deliver. And why? Because in my mind, the prospect or the client who comes to me, they're the one in trouble. They're the one who has these seven deadly sins happening for them. And uh, not me. And so if they want my help, they pay me first. Mm. It's an incredibly important thing to do. The, the most sleep I personally have lost in the last uh, 20 years of practice, particularly the last 15 years of practice, and particularly the last three years of practice, is where I broke the rule of charging for everything um, because I felt totally and utterly used. Uh, 18 months ago, um, we entered a competition. Uh, it was an unpaid competition. I asked to be paid. The project was so ravishing, so extraordinary, and so out of any sector we'd ever worked in before that even though we weren't going to be paid, it was impossible not to do it. It was just impossible. It should have been impossible. We should have said no. And we engaged with it. And I, I have an NDA, so I'm not going to tell you where it was. Um, we trounced the competition. I'm very good at pitching. <laughs> and we, uh, we, we, we pitched not just because we're good at selling, we're good at sharing, not selling, but sharing fabulous ideas. And, uh, and, and our client, or nearly client, thought our ideas were absolutely extraordinary. And we pit strategy with specificity, a balance of architecture, urbanism, and landscape to drive place. And, and, and we won unanimously the pitch. Uh, I got the call. The inception meeting was next Tuesday. I popped open the champagne, and the whole studio celebrated. Between that time and the inception meeting, I got a call saying that our practice wasn't well known enough and that we weren't this star or that star. I'm not going to say which star. We were dumped by the investors having won the competition. And our scheme got consent a little while ago. Uh, I saw it. And it's not our scheme anymore, it's somebody else's scheme. And I can't tell you any more than that. <laughs> but it was very, very, very painful. And yeah. I tried to work out why it was so painful. One, because our ideas have been stolen blatantly. Um, but two, we had no credit, no authorship at all. And three, we had not been paid a penny. And it was like deeply, deeply hurtful. And uh, on so many levels. And in a way, I think if you're paid at least something, then at least you can say, it was a commission. It was a £1,000 commission. It was a £2,000 commission. It was a £5,000 commission. It was a £10,000 commission. You know, when you get involved in a REBA competition and you get paid £2,500, you're not hitting yourself when you lose. The, 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 the loser doesn't feel deeply wounded. You still put it on your website as a young practice and say, we came forth. We were paid £2,500. It was an honorarium. It was half of nothing, but it was still £2,500. It was a commission. We're not silenced. It's not embarrassing. We were the runners-up. But when you're asked to do something for free, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's deeply uh, dangerous for, 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 for you, your mind, <laughs> your emotional quotient, and your practice, uh, and the way your practice sees itself, and for our profession. It should be completely and utterly banned. Uh, uh, in my opinion, um, by well, our profession. Yeah. It should be illegal to offer your services for free, in my opinion. Yeah. Hazel. Yeah, I mean, there's a principle we adopted quite early on in the 20-year history that, you know, we're architects. At the end of the day, ideas are our sales tool. <laughs> that, that's, that's what we have, you know. If, if you have the idea, a technician or someone could go and detail a building 
or detail a place or whatever. Um, but ideas are everything to us, so why everything. would we give that away for free? Absolutely. And you've got to be really principled about that. Yeah. Um, that's not to say that you know sometimes there is that balance and there might be a really key repeat client and part of getting a scheme going is to do a little bit of feasibility work. But it's taking a balanced view on those things and knowing which clients really aren't going to take the piss out of you. Um, I think we also learned that open competitions unpaid competitions they're just they're just not worth it there's thousands millions of other architects doing it we now will will do um, shortlisted competitions because we know that that client likes us enough to put us on the shortlist in the first place so they can't not want to work shortlisted with us. paid competitions yeah. and those are the ones that come with an honorarium and it might be quite small so actually does it really cover your costs but it's the principle that they see some worth in your ideas and, and that's what we have as architects. You know? If you what, give yeah. away your ideas for nothing, then what have you got left to sell? Yeah. 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 What, one Hold that, yeah. that, 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 that. Well, what I'm going to do is going to ask some audience questions now. Great. So has anybody got a question that you'd like to pose to the panel? Yes, this gentleman here. Um, oh, okay. uh, David, this one's for you mainly, because you said something quite early on about um, nurturing new practices that have come out of yours. Hmm. Um, how have you got there? How have you got to that mindset? Because that's uncommon. Uh, the, the typical uh, thing that I've come across is to be very insular and very... It doesn't typically end amicably as the way you're describing. Yeah. Um, a, 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 fun, a fundamental mindset, and again, this is not a taught mindset, so it might be an incorrect mindset, but it's a mindset that I've had for a very long time, is that uh, if you choose to be in our profession, it's a, it's, it's, to me, it's a lifestyle choice. It's, uh, it's, it's everything to me. Uh, and, and the people that thrive in the environment that we've created over the last 15 years are of a very similar mindset in that it's everything to them. Not that we, <laughs> no, <laughs> but it's everything to them. It's their lifestyle. And, and as such, um, I think it's the only thing one can respect uh, someone is to say, if, if, it's, if it's the thing for you to do, then you should do it. Uh, I, I should be able to give you the opportunity to stay within the environment that we have. But the day you don't want to be working in our studio, please don't wait. <laughs> and I've talked to the studio many times before about this. On a Monday morning or a Friday evening, you can ask anybody. I've made it very clear. If the day you don't want to be in this studio, please leave that today. I'm very, you know, you know, very, very happy for that. Um, and not just during recession times. Because I think it's so weird to try and entrap someone or to somehow capture their energy in a weird, uh, a, a weird way. It's, it's more empowering to say, let's make it the right time. When it has worked for us um, has been when um, we've had a reciprocal, a reciprocal relationship with um, um, a respectful lever who is excited and delighted about their practice, that doesn't in any way try to um, undermine us, undermine our strategies, undermine our tactics, undermine our pay structures, undermine our fee uh, uh, tactics, and, and actually respect the contract that we have with that person, whether it be six months, nine months, or a year, don't talk to our clients, for example. And, and is in a way um, respectful of us and says, thanks very much for being there and helping me grow and mature and let's hang out. One of those practices, I'm not going to name this, this live thing, um, we have passed at least three projects to. Absolute boom, nice size project to them. Uh, amazing new client. I remember sitting and this amazing new client came to see us. Everybody in a really, really cute, cool client. You know, maybe when you're working with them, I won't say their name. They came in, they sat down and said, we want to build a relationship with the practice. We want this, we want this. And I was like, Everything you're saying, you know what? Why don't you not build a relationship with us? Why don't you go and build a relationship with them, that practice that left us a year ago? They will nurture you. They will love you. They will make you their top, top, top priority, where you'll probably be, honestly, probably number nine for us in our pecking order. Go to them. You'll be numero uno. And it was fab. But on the flip side, I remember a terrible moment when someone else came to me and said, I've just called up one of 
you're our clients, and, uh, and I've offered to do what you're doing cheaper, because I can, because it's easy for me to do that. And that created a bit of a, a moment, which I still hope will become overcome at one point, but it created a moment. So not all these things are, are mm. perfect. Um, but as I said, we've had five or six practices pop out, either graphic design practices or architecture practices or blended architecture and landscape practices. And, and I think it's fab. Hope Hazel. there's more. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think it's so unusual. If uh, in certain practices it might be unusual in some. Uh, yeah, we've done a similar thing, and, and I totally agree with David. If, if someone has decided they want to give it a go themselves and they've got enough ambition and energy to do that, um, and they are itching to do it, then there's no point in trying to shackle them to a desk in your studio. Yeah? All you can do is encourage that. And actually sometimes see it as an as a asset to you in some ways. You know, We've got a couple of projects where we've had quite a few practices do the same usually one-man bands. We've got a couple of people now affiliated with each of our studios. They're a great outlet to us because you don't really want to refuse work and you want to maintain a relationship with a client, but sometimes you can't take everything on and you can pass it that way. We're doing a couple now in collaboration with... Uh, and, and so they've taken a job with them because rather mm. than us shackling them to a desk when they were ready to go and do something else and disrupting the rest of the studio because they were getting frustrated, which is a big part of the morale of the studio. Mm. Um, and rather than us then having this problem of how do we resource that and do we take someone on that we don't even know if they can do the job properly, then we've just ended up evolving some projects into collaborations, mm. gives them a springboard. Anyone that wants to give it a go, we all know it's hard work. Let's Let's help them. Yeah, no, no. let's not be naive about this. If someone's absolutely sensational in your practice, then, uh, then of course position, you do yeah. sit down and say, I would love you to stay. That would be a complete lie to, to, yeah. to not say that. I would love you to stay. What would you like to be doing? What would make it different for you? Um, and I've definitely told the Mike Davies within Richard Rogers story at least twice in the last 15 years, where it's not called the Mike Davies practice, but boy, that guy designs extraordinarily and found a way of designing within whatever it's now called, Roger Sterk Harbour and Partners, prior to that, Richard Rogers and Partners, and had an extraordinary career and is very, very noted and uh, noteworthy uh, with, with, with the work that he's done. Um, so there is always that conversation, but I think that conversation should happen once. <laughs> and yeah. there shouldn't be some weird offer and weird shackles and weird, oh, but what about, and maybe this, and a promise of that, and a promise of this. It should be good luck. Um, and, um, yeah, Great. incredibly important. Yeah. One more question. It's Lorenz, is it? <laughs> Hi, thank you. And on point three, I think, I guess, the other big threat is where is no market demand. So I guess all of you have uh, um, um, been through the 2008 crisis. So I wonder if you can share with us some very practical, very specific tips on how to survive in, you know, uh, trou tr troubled times, especially now that probably we're not in a big crisis probably as as that one, but yet there are clouds, big clouds at the horizon probably. I don't know. I don't know if you can share your, your tips. David? Diversification. I think we've already heard it uh, tonight. Diversity in terms of your team, but diversity in terms of your skill set. Uh, I'm an urban designer, um, so that's a rather fundamental thing to the foundation of, of our practice, 50-50 uh, a combination of our architecture and urban design. Christophe Gray, architect, and I'm an urban designer. But as the studio has grown, we've continued to diversify, diversify, diversify. We were just as prone as anybody else um, in 2007, 2008. And we actually found that it was the diversification into public realm and landscape and detailed landscape and uh, installations and art interventions and sculpture in a way that actually uh, survived. And, and the, the one project that saw us through the toughest year was actually a kinetic, or semi-kinetic, uh, titanium sculpture in, in, in Stratford, which all had us scratching our heads in disbelief as to why on earth one would get involved in that, do that. But actually it was joyful and it allowed us to think in a different way and it allowed us to expand into landscape and now we have Seven, arch seven landscape architects in the studio. And you know, the, the next 
the next wave for us. I don't know what it is. It might be poetry. It might be uh, a strong, strong meanwhile use contractor arm. It might be uh, writing. It definitely will be uh, theatre and, and exhibitions. You know, we now have an exhibitions team, uh, which we invented last year. So, you know, the next thing that will happen will just give us another ooh in the throat, in the chest, in the, in the face, and we'll, we'll, we'll have to respond. Um, so diversification and not being afraid of diversification is, for me, the answer to the question. Tim? There's another more... You said about practical uh, ideas. I mean, I think the fundamental thing is discovering what the market need actually is. Um, I had a very useful experience when I first set up a practice that I... Um, there was these sort of websites where you could get leads to go and talk to people about projects, and you'd put oh, yeah. something in, and you know you'd get. And five architects were allowed to have this person's details, and I got the details with somebody on the South Downs who wanted a new build house. I thought oh, that's fantastic. I got this guy's details, and the problem was I had zero portfolio. I had nothing because I'd just set up. I was literally sat in my shed, just you know scratching my head and wondering what to do. <laughs> uh, and so I rang the guy and said, look, can I come and talk to you? Come see the site, come and have a chat, what you want, you know, and sat and listened to him and his wife about the dream and the vision, and we walked all around and looked at the rocks and the trees and everything else, and off I went again. And he rang me and said, I'd like to come and do the work, and off we went. And then one day when I was down there on site, he said, you know why I gave you the job, don't you? And I said, I have absolutely no idea. And he said, well, I, there's five architects' names. Um, four of them sent me stuff saying, this is what we do, and you turned up and said, what do you want? And in a way, that has come to be the kind of hallmark of what we do now. And funnily enough, uh, the experience of going to Cranfield last year, um, I had a load of lectures on strategy and business strategy, and they talked about perceived user value. In other words, what is it that your clients mm. find valuable is mm. the core question. And it comes back to exactly the same thing, of asking people, what is it you want from us? Mm. And then trying to deliver that thing. And so in a way, of the existing clients or existing leads you have, actually going and asking them what they want, listening and genuinely listening, and not just going, we did this architecture thing, you want this? But actually trying to understand what it is that they are asking you for, and then seeing if you can deliver that thing. Um, and that can lead you in all sorts of other interesting directions that you didn't necessarily see coming. Um, I'd go even further. Yeah. Not only what are they looking for, what's hurting them? What are they fearful of? What didn't work in the past? What are they hoping to mitigate against? What have they done that didn't work they'd never want to do again? Opening up that whole conversation and find out what's hurting them and then scratch it a little bit so they feel it right there. And then, <laughs> and because here's the thing, people buy for emotional reasons. Then they justify it with logic. And most of us present people with a logical solution. Yeah. You go the wrong way around, so very nice. Ask them what they want mm. and why they want it and why they wouldn't want it this way and why they want it that way and just open up the conversation, conversation. And so, yeah, people buy for emotional reasons. Mm. And the other thing is, don't go out there to get your emotional needs met. If you're going out there to the marketplace to get your emotional needs met, you're in big trouble mm. because they will smell that and they will, a good buyer will smell that. And as well, Tesco, Tesco train, they send them to psychological warfare training camps, yeah, to smell a, a seller's fear etc. <laughs> low self-esteem and they go in there and they tear them apart and they get another half a percent off on 75,000 tons of apples for that year. And the guy walks away thinking he, he did a good deal because they only took a, an extra half a percent. But over 75,000 tons of apples, it's massive. So you've got people out there trained. But your average person who isn't trained is still good at that. My wife, she's from Vietnam. She is fierce when she goes to the marketplace. <laughs> <laughs> she learned that from her mum and all the other women in the village. Fierce. I said, where did you learn that? I want to be able to, <laughs> to buy like that. Mm. Yeah? So, um, yeah. Tara. No, I'd, I'd, I'd echo, um, I, think, I think everything that's that said, and in, in my view, is uh, that concept of diversity. And I think as architects, we just need to stop being lazy. I think we, we, we like something, we do architecture, and we stick to it. But we don't challenge ourselves enough mm. to say, actually, do you know what? What's pushing the boundary? What's in society? What's the need in society? And how can we respond mm. to it? Um, if you want to be a fitness blogger, do it. If you want to be a yoga instructor, do it. Um, but I think we're so lazy that oh, we've gotten used to this architecture thing. We've spent so much time training in this architecture thing. And actually, the market need is there. It just is about whether you're, you're ready to change your own mindset and respond to it. So 
as the much. Thing, the thing with the recessions is a recession on average every eight years. It's a fact. Yeah. Every eight years, there's a recession. How many businesses are prepared for that? How many mindsets understand there's a recession? I go into businesses, I look at their, 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 um, their accounts, and uh, the first thing I look at is the pile of unpaid invoices. Not that they haven't paid, but their clients haven't paid. And then the balance sheet, etc. Um, but very few companies have reserves for recession. Yeah, I, mean, I, would, I would echo the diversification and everything else. I mean, going back to the question it, itself as well, it, you know, we're architects. We've got innovative, creative minds. And that's not just about the design that you Correct. put on paper. Yeah. You know, we, we need to use that in a business sense as well. And, yeah. and then it is the balance every time between not doing free work and not, and not um, exposing yourself too much. But you know, on the back of the last recession is when we, with, with the one client that we had, we then went and diversified. We were doing additional rooms for doctor surgeries as kind mm. of efficient little boxes mm. just to pay the salary of one guy. If we had one of those in, that's great. So we were thinking on that level, but at the same time, uh, Urban Splash, who were a great client of ours, chips were down, they were asset managers, where were they gonna go? So we developed the modular product with them they had no fees to pay us for development, yeah? And actually, they gave us a small honorarium for the competition that we did, and then they said, well, we haven't got any money to do this. And so then we thought, well, let's be creative about it. We, we agreed a royalty deal, right? Like a record, yeah? Well, if you're gonna do housing and, and do a lot of them in the future, you might do 10, you might do 200, you do, might do 2 million. It's our risk and it's your risk. Let's share that risk on the back of a recession. Mm -hmm. Let's think slightly differently to what architects are so used to, yeah. doing the norm, thinking the same mm. way all the time, doing the 90-day payment terms and everything else. You know, we're, we're architects for a reason. We've got creative minds, so it's just and thinking can, yeah. at every level. And you can only do that if you have a habit of working on the business as yeah. much as in the business. Yeah. If you're just working in the business, you're chasing your tail. Yeah. You'll never catch up. Yeah. You need to be able to pull one person at least, and I know in your organization it's you, one person <laughs> needs to elevate themselves from the business and look at, the horizon and prepare for those dips in the economy and for whatever else is going on. I think enjoying the change is yeah. incredibly important. You know, you look for the practical kind of response. Don't wait for it to happen to you. Um, if you can see something coming, um, it's pretty, pretty obvious where there's a downturn in work and it can happen literally overnight. It can happen in a fortnight. It can happen in a month. I would definitely say don't sit on your hands and say, oh, well, it's going to be OK. You know, uh, uh, adapt, to, adapt to the change. Be, be as responsive as you can as quickly as you can. Uh, we were often advised when we were a younger practice, and we, we do still do that, to have six months of um, um, our overhead in the bank as a target. Good. It's not easy to do, mm -hmm. but we, we currently have, you know, yeah. this is quite a big overhead, 65 yeah. people in a groovy, uh, groovy space in Clerkenwell, but we have that in the bank. And yet, even though I listened to that, and even though we practiced that, I wouldn't wait for that six months of underperformance uh, to then just sort of kill our practice. It would be on month two <laughs> after that one month of, ooh, hang on, that something's not right here, that we had actioned something. Yeah. I, I don't know what the action is or how, 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 what the biggest sense of remediation needs to be or the change of direction or the change of flow or the change of how we work or how we collaborate or whatever it, the, the response is, whatever the change required, don't wait too long. <laughs> you have really. it in the bank, but you behave as if you don't. But absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's the right way. Yeah. Brilliant. I think we're going we're gonna to have to end it there. But thank you so much for your conversation. And thank you so much for your questions. A massive round of applause, too. So that is a wrap. Thank you for listening. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.